The Athletic. Ladies and gentlemen, it is showtime. Please welcome the team of the Fulhamish Podcast. It's the Fulhamish Podcast, your independent voice of Fulham FC. My name's Sammy James. Welcome to the show brought to you by The Athletic UK. And today we'll be discussing the return of the goal machine that is Fulham Football Club 5 in South Wales last night as a as a blistering second half performance dispatched 10-man Swansea City. And it was very, very nice to see the goals flying in at the Swansea.com stadium. It means that Fulham are 14 points clear of second and third after Bournemouth dropped even more points last night. And it's official. I've joined Camp Wen. I know that lots of you have been on that island for a long time, but my flag is fully planted. Fulham are going up. And here to discuss everything from Tuesday with me is the regular Thursday club, Peter Rutzler. Hello. Hey, Sammy. Welcome to the WEN Club. Oh, it's lovely to be here. And Jack Collins, hello. Uh, hello, listeners. Hello, Sammy. Welcome. It's, it's good. It's nice on this end of the uh, under the spectrum. I'm, I'm pretty comfortable here these days. Oh, so glorious last night. A long trip to South Wales, but the travelling faithful fully rewarded with a blistering second half performance. Uh, before we get into the game, let's do some three word reviews. Jack, what were the best ones that came in? Well, the Fulhamish squad um, decided they were going to turn up last night with these. Normally, you don't tend to see them um, turn up and, and respond, but our own Cam Ramsey with Fulham taking liberty. Uh, I really, really enjoyed. And Jack Kelly swan our way. Uh, two, two very, very clever ones there. Swan our um, way is fantastic. Yeah. Ross McSweeney with 10 Manning Masterclass, I thought was lots of fun. Alistair Nimmo, Swansea uh, later championship. Um, and of course, the mighty David Lloyd of There's Only One F in Fulham with Crossbar Challenge Fail, which really did make me laugh. Very, very nice. Thank you for those, Jack. Some great three word reviews as ever. And of course, Four wins in a row, still top of the league. It does meet horn criteria. Uh, I mentioned on Sunday how I want some custom horns sent in from you guys. Send me a good horn and I will play it. And this one is from Andrew Sherman, who has said, this is a Welsh horn sound submission for the win against Swansea. It's from a Welsh lighthouse in honour of Nico's fantastic brace. It's the Nash Point Lighthouse uh, and it makes uh, this horn-like sound so I thought it would be perfect for the pod. All aboard. Sounds like a whale. <laughs> Peter, ray my horn. Six, six. I'm, yeah. I'm more of a traditionalist when it comes to horns. You know. I mean, I'm more than happy just to give you a blast of the... Oh, yes, there we go. I'm happy now. I do enjoy the custom ones though, so keep sending them in to hello at fulhamish.co.uk. Peter, a wonderful evening and a return of the goals for Fulham. Uh, it's it's a welcome return. There's been lots of narrow, gritty wins. We've been discussing it lots on the podcast lately, but but last night was a bit of a return to some of the Fulham that we saw in January and, and at the back end of 2021. Yeah, long overdue. It's not really been acceptable, these recent performances, so um, it's been back on uh, straight and narrow. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the, the interesting thing like about this Fulham team is, and, and you got the sense as soon as that red card happened, you thought, oh no, from a Swans perspective anyway, like this could be trouble. And, and that's just based around the way Fulham play and the way Marcus Silva wants his team to play. Um, not just in terms of uh, their ruthlessness, and we've talked about how when they sense chance to really hammer home an advantage they will take it give them an inch they'll take more than a mile but also uh, stylistically as well um it just seems it's they're, they're very well equipped to play against 10 men they're very good at exploiting space they're very good at making runs uh in behind between the lines and to be honest they weren't even that great second half you know it wasn't like reading where fulham just upped the ante and hit quite a few gears up um so there were there was there were moments in that second half where it was, you know, pretty pretty low key. 
Um, I think before the fourth goal or the fifth one, I was about to tweet, you know, Fulham aren't really too fussed about this. You know, there was a hush around the ground. Uh, and then within about 20 seconds, I think Nico Williams had stuck the ball in the back of the net. It's like, ah, okay. Well, it felt like 3 0 Fulham were cruising, and then it was almost Swansea getting it to 3 1, which, and we've done that several times this season, Jack, where it almost annoys us. Yeah, don't poke um, the bear. Yeah, and they poked the bear, didn't they? Actually, I think Fulham potentially would have just sat on 3 0, maybe got a fourth out of a bit of luck if, if it had come to us. But I think there is an element, and it's, it happened against Barnsley, um, happened against Birmingham City, happened against Bristol City to an extent, where opposition gets a goal and Fulham almost instantly go up and respond. Yeah, I, I think this is it, right? And and like, obviously the poke the bear thing is, is slightly tug in cheek, but there is also an element of being like, look, it's 3-0. We're quite happy to conserve our energy. We're playing a lot of midweek games and then a, you know, a weekend game, then a midweek game. If there's 20 minutes left on the clock, we're quite happy to, to kind of just be like, okay, that's all right. We'll just knock it about and conserve energy. And suddenly if they go and if they go and really, you know, wind Fulham up by scoring a goal, I'm like, okay. We would be nice here. And, and I don't mean that in a, in a disparaging way, but with 10 men and at 3-0 down, you're never going to come back and draw the game. You just aren't. Like, it's, it's just not going to happen. And ultimately, Fulham went, right, okay, if that's what you're going to do, we'll score twice more. Uh, and your goal difference has, has, has suffered on the back of it. Because, you know, there is kind of this feeling, and, and Peter's right, that you're a bit like the hush on the stadium. Everyone was quite calm. You've seen those games peter out before. And, and ultimately... You know, it, because Swansea scored, and look, you got given due respect for going and continuing to push onwards. And look, it was, I think the commentator said at the time, said, This is about the furthest forward Swansea have been all half. And, you know, they <laughs> won the corner. Um, they obviously, it's a well worked corner. It's a good header. It's a good goal. Um, but ultimately, it, it did feel a bit like, OK, Fulham are quite content here. Maybe let's not roll them up. And, and, and that's exactly what happened with the goal. And, and Fulham went on and scored two more. I like that your analysis there is that Swansea shouldn't have scored. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is a bit. It's because also, look, you look at actually what Russell Martin was trying to do, and you saw him take off Michael Obafemi, oh, no. right? And 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 part of that, I think, you know, widely accepted was the idea that Swansea were like, right, we've got another game at the weekend. This one's done and dusted. Let's just kind of relax a little bit here and and try not to waste our energy on a game that's already done. You know, it's like going for a 40-yard sprint up the pitch when you're 3-0 down in the 80th minute. It's pointless. It's a complete waste of energy. And the chances are that you're actually going to, you're more likely to injure yourself or put yourself out of contention for another game than you are, you know, trying to get back into it. And I do appreciate that obviously there's a level of professionalism and you have to continue to, to push onwards and, and you'd ex we'd expect the same from Fulham. But I, I, I think the substitutions in, in the kind of manner they were and the game state meant that it kind of felt like it, it was kind of, okay, right, we're done, they're done, everyone's done here. Let's just, you know, kind of all move. I think if you'd offered both teams the whistle on the 60-minute mark, they would have taken it. And I, and I think that's a fair point. It's not, a, it's not disparaging, I don't think, to be like, okay, Fulham had the game comfortably won and sewn up by that point. And, and then so to go on and play that extra kind of half an hour was probably not particularly beneficial to either side, right? Fulham have a game on the weekend, so does Swansea. They had to play with 10 men. They were working incredibly hard. And, and therefore, there's that kind of state of being like, okay, let's all just sit on this and just let this one ride out. And, and, and to go and score, I think probably put them in a, in a situation where they had to work harder after the goal. And if that has a negative effect on the weekend, you'll look back, they'll look back at that and be like, that was silly. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I don't think I've ever heard analysis that says a team shouldn't have scored. I don't, dis I don't disagree. It's just hilarious. Um, Peter, let's go on to the red card. Um, from the stands, I didn't expect to see a red. It's one of those that I think probably your angle on the middle of the pitch, the TV angle, it's a pretty clear. In the stands, it just looked like a badly timed challenge. But I can't understand what Swansea are moaning about here. They've actually appealed the red card. His studs are up. He's out of control. He catches Harry Wilson on the upper leg. And maybe in the 80s. And it's from behind. Like, yeah. <laughs> if it's in the 80s, yeah. maybe it's not a red card. But in modern game, it's, it's, clear. it's, it's completely clear. It has no redeeming features. Yeah, um, Russell Martin came into post-match press and was like, yeah, it was a really poor decision. Um, we're going to appeal it. And I think quite a few of us were in there and were like, oh, okay. That's not sort of the angle we were anticipating for, from him here. Um, well, I had a really good view of it as one of the best views of a tackle like that. I've had it again, um, about 10 yards away. And 
I was pretty sure it was a red card when I, on first view because of how, because of the lack of control with the challenge. Uh, the replays don't improve it. Um, didn't look good. It was interesting that Marco Silva said he thought it was a yellow as well, and he had an even better view. It was literally there in front of it. Um, and then he said he saw Harry Wilson's leg and, and changed his mind. Um, his reaction in real time did not... Sc- you can no. see the replay. It doesn't look like a man that thought that was a yellow. I wonder if he's rolling back some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, referee criticisms of, of the past a little bit. But... Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it was, it's a red card. I, I can't see the, but I mean, at full time, we had where the press seats were, you could Swansea fans sort of filter out and they can stand right behind you and practically read what you write. Um, and uh, there was one fan who just went and stood next to another journalist next to me and was just like, the referee's been a terrible, I hope you're writing that the referee was absolutely appalling. And, and um, the, the, the journalist who I think was from uh, a Welsh paper, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but. Um, he certainly wasn't of a full persuasion. Was and was like, ah, oh, come on, come on, you know, that's clearly a red card. Have you seen this? I've seen it back. I've seen it back. It was definitely, definitely not a red card. Um, and I do wonder how much blinkers come come into play, and maybe that explains a bit of the Russell Martin thing. But um, yeah, I, I I thought it was pretty clear. I thought it was pretty clear. I don't think there's much debate to be had on it. And yeah, I mean, it it did change the game completely, mm. completely change the game. And I think there's probably a bit of resentment from our Swansea side that they had a game that they were in had a game that was competitive. It was not necessarily clear-cut that Fulham were going to do what they ultimately did. Um, Fulham were struggling to press them well. They were struggling to, to stop them playing out. They, they improved towards the end of the first half. They weren't really creating that much. Um, should have had a penalty when Fabio Carvalho got tripped. Um, but, you know, aside from that, it was a game. It was a good game. Fans were involved. And I think there's probably... The red card disappointment is probably that it affected the game more so than the fact that the decision was... Was incorrect. It was the right decision. It was the right decision. I think this is the thing, right? If you're Swansea, obviously there's going to be an element of anger about that. And that's fair enough because Piers absolutely spot on there. Like it was a very fair, even contest in the first half. Even if that Obafemi shot from distance was Swansea's only real chance, it felt like a, you know, a, a tough game. It was going to be a battle. But I think there's misplaced anger here in some parts the anger should be at ryan manning because not only is it a bad challenge but that's fine you can make mistakes right it's completely and utterly unnecessary he's going nowhere it's in our own half there's like almost no need like no reason whatsoever to fly in there and look manning's got history for this it's not a you know this isn't a one-off we've seen him get sent off for silly decisions before both at qpr and at swansea he's made rash tackles get a rush of blood to the head and he kind of loses control of the game state and it's just in such a bizarre position and i can appreciate that there is anger towards like the game flipping on its head and therefore not being the contest that fans were looking for fair enough but that anger should be placed at Ryan Manning's door because there's no need to make that challenge whatsoever it's reckless it's high it's late and he catches, you know, Wilson's calf with his studs up. Like, it's just in every single part of the world, a red card. Like, there's there's no day of the week that watching on, you know, if that goes into, if that's in the Premier League and that goes to VAR and it's given as yellow, that gets overturned, I think. That's how, that's where the, the line is for me now. It's not a, it's not an all borderline. They wouldn't overturn, they'd overturn that. It's high and it's late and it's reckless. Um, and, and so ultimately, look, I like Ryan Manning. He's a Republic of Ireland international and I want him to do well. But it's not the first time he's made these kind of challenges and it probably won't be the last. And that's where I think the, the misplaced anger should be here. Yeah, there is some Swansea previous towards Jared Gillett as well. The, um, the referee who is, of course, um, uh, Australian and he moved to England uh, a year and a half ago and he's generally seen as one of the better referees and he had that viral clip a couple of years ago where he was mic'd up for an A-League game and so he's I'd, I'd guess slightly more famous than your average referee I think because of that clip I, I thought he was decent last night I had no complaints but I guess I would wouldn't I and I, as you say Jack I think it's a red all day long I didn't think it in the stadium but when you're that far away you can't see the detail of whether it's high it's studs etc it just looked like a heavy challenge um, to me Peter second half missed that goal uh, the first one because it came 17 seconds into the start of the uh, second half there were a lot of Fulham fans still in the concourse as you could imagine for that one um, and I remember thinking before this game, I'd seen a lot of Swansea and I'd seen that they do like to obviously pass it around the back, but some of their passing is quite high risk. Um, 
And yeah, Andy Fisher's uh, pass to Matt Grimes definitely was high risk and, and Fulham uh, exploited it. Yeah, no, they did. I, I also didn't see it at first viewing. So um, it's one of those, what happened? It's in the net. Who scored? Um, uh, <laughs> Too busy having so his uh, cake and tea at half time. Oh, no, no. I was there. I just was looking at my laptop when I should have been looking at the game. Ah. Um, but yeah, no, you're right. I mean, 22 take risks. Um, and as I mentioned before, I think Fulham weren't getting it right in terms of how to take advantage of the way they were playing out. I don't mm. think they were pressing effectively. They made it a little bit too easy. Silver said this afterwards as well that you know it's they, they want they had a plan to deal with it. It was always going to be a different game because of how Swansea play. Um, and Fulham like to you know have the ball, control games with the ball, but they weren't going to do that here. Um, but if you can get it right, if you can press them at the right moments, you can force mistakes. And um, I think Russell Martin afterwards took the blame for it, saying we make it, we make we let them play out like that. They're going to make errors like that. But um, it wasn't a good pass, was it? I mean, it's. It was on a plate, really, for for Reed to nick it and uh, and to, to to be put away. And I think again, we mentioned ruthlessness earlier in that second half. At everything that Swansea did wrong, Fulham were punishing pretty much. You know, it wasn't like Fulham were creating chance after chance and spurning them. The chances they created, they they just they put away. Um, and that first goal sort of typified it. It was important, I thought, Jack, because I was saying to a couple of people at half time, I was like. I, Fulham were about to score before the half. I, you know, they went down to 10 men and we just suddenly were dominating them for the three or four minutes that there were following the red card. And then half time came and I thought that's really not ideal because now maybe Russell Martin will go in, rally the troops and figure out a way for them to kind of grind out a nil-nil for as long as they can. But then 17 seconds into the second half score, and I mean, it was the perfect thing that Fulham needed in order to open the floodgates. Because even if that went on five, 10 minutes into the second half, I think Swansea might've got a foothold and maybe would have found a way of, of keeping Fulham out. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, you can imagine Russell Martin would have been absolutely fuming. He would have come out and given that talk, team talk being like, right, you know, keep it tight for 15 minutes and, and then maybe we can look to to exploit a little bit more and, and, and kind of kick on in the game and hopefully maybe nick something. Even if it's a point here, a point against the league leaders with 10 men for 45 minutes is a good point, um, even if you are at home. But if, if it's tight and it's close, then you could always look to nick something from a set piece, as they did. Um, and, and he would have been absolutely livid that, it took all of 17 seconds to unravel them. But then again, you know, we've seen that high risk, high reward football pay off for them in, in recent games. Uh, maybe this wasn't the opportunity to do it. But, you know, as, as Peter said, I didn't think the triggers and the pressing triggers in the first half were particularly strong. I think that we we pushed at some of the wrong times that we looked to, you know, overload at the wrong times and we actually got played through. Uh, our press got played through quite a lot. Um, and it's something that we've seen us do to other teams when they don't press correctly. Uh, it's not something we've seen massively from from our side in, in that regard this season. Um, so I was a bit concerned. And, and so you can see why they were trying to play through us because they've been doing so for the first half. But obviously you get that 15 minutes. And whilst you're right in that it felt like Fulham were on top for the last two, three minutes of that half um, after the red card and Swansea felt a bit disorganised. And Harrison Reed had all sorts of space on the right wing for like five minutes. Um, yeah. But whilst, while that kind of thing, you know, was going on, you can imagine that Marcus Silva got them in and was like, right, what's going on with these pressing triggers? Because they're all over the place. We're not pressing effectively. You're not working as a unit. And as soon as that happened, as soon as we were able to get going in, in that kind of regard, everything started to click. And, and suddenly Fulham have won the ball in transition on the edge of the opposition box uh, and you clean through. And, and Mitrovic makes no mistake. And the Swansea game plan goes out the window, right? And, and suddenly then you're like, okay, what goes on? And you know, obviously that carried on into the rest of the game and, you know, I don't want to fast forward too much, but when Swansea scored, they were lamenting the fact that as they scored, they were just lamenting the fact that they'd conceded a sloppy third from kind of a situation that they didn't need to concede in whatsoever. And then they scored and the commentators barely celebrated. They were like, oh, great goal. But imagine if we hadn't conceded two minutes ago and we had, you know, we were in this with, with a game gone and, and suddenly, yes, we got 10 men, but this is a, a completely changed game to what it is right now. And I thought that, Fulham's press in the second half was really effective. We turned it on and turned it off like a tap. Um, and we were able to kind of just control large swathes of the game in both possession and territory senses, um, which made things a lot easier as a viewer. Yeah, it did feel like at times in the uh, second half, Fulham could just turn off and on goals uh, a little bit like a uh, tap. Um, Peter, your piece reviewing the game last night is out on The Athletic. Uh, it's about free score of Fulham uh, and they're closing in on promotion, but can they break records? Uh, we talked about earlier how we are camp when 
and that is happening a 14 point gap with 11 games to go is is a hell of an advantage particularly when there's still a game in hand on on Huddersfield so are we reaching the stage now where actually Fulham's aim should be the title not promotion obviously Mark is going to be taking it one game at a time and he's not going to say anything different but is that the aim now title I mean it's got to be hasn't it yeah no I would say absolutely yes um look obviously it's not done yet obviously you know weird things happen but you know <laughs> in the grand scheme of things Fulham Fulham will be returned to the Premier League by an automatic promotion spot barring something absolutely catastrophic that will live long in the memory of everyone um they're in a position now where what, the, the requirement of 17 points, and I know Cottage Analytica has been all over this, been really, really good keeping track of it all. But so it's 17 points, it's six wins uh, and a couple of draws. It's, six, uh, sorry, it's 16 six, in six real wins. It's 16 in real time, isn't it? Because of the goal difference. Yeah. 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 So six, 16 points, it's about six wins. And that's, <laughs> that's in worst case scenario where Huddersfield win all their games and Bournemouth hit really good form as well. That's, that's, if that's required. Um, and yes, th- there are some away games coming up. It's a tricky run at the moment. There's no guarantee that Barnsley away will be a win. West Brom away will be a win. Even that said, we're in a position where I, I just cannot see Fulham not achieving automatic promotion. And to be honest, we- we've known it's been a-, a really impressive season. We've had some incredible, incredible games. Like, if- if to-, to go Swansea and win 5-1, I mean, that's that in itself is unique. I mean, it's the 13th time Fulham have, Won a game by three or three or more goals, um, which is which is ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous, and I think now you you really want to hammer home that advantage. You want to keep up that momentum. I don't think you want to be in a position where you're sort of just trundling to the finish line. It's like, look, if you don't feel that automatic promotion is that target, the next thing's a title. Can can they make sure to win the title comfortably? Fulham have won six titles since they became a limited company in like 1903, I think. So. It's a rare thing. You've got to take advantage of this now. And there are other records as well. You know, we talked about the goals they could score. You know, there's the league-wide goal scoring record. I think the last team to score more than 100 goals in the championship was uh, Kevin Keegan's Man City team, I think. Yeah. Um, so, you know, these are the things that Fulham should be looking to, 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 to get to, to put themselves in their company, to really sort of underline and underscore that this has been an impressive season. And that should be an extra incentive. That's how I see it anyway. Um, but to go back to your original point, yeah, I, I think, I think, yeah, we are at this point where Fulham should be looking at the title. I think we might have been at that point for a little while, to be perfectly sure. honest with you. Um, yeah. And look, I, I, there is, look, we should caveat the fact that like catastrophic things have happened before. Like, you know, we, we could, you could get three season ending injuries to three key players in the next game and, and everything might fall apart. But it would take something ridiculous for Fulham not to be promoted at this point, especially with the form that everyone else is in. So barring like unprecedented circumstances, and I hate that word because it's been chucked around so much over the last couple of years. um, But barring like a a circumstance which no one could foresee, this would be beyond any sort of like concept or or whatever the concept is of Fulhamish and, and snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. I get it loads of clubs have a thing like this Atleti have a thing called El Pupas which basically means the cursed ones and Betis have a thing called Manque Pierda which means we support you even more when you lose um, th- there is a you know a feeling around certain clubs and, and I think there has been for a while you know around Fulham but this isn't that it, you know this would be this isn't oh Fulham getting close and nearly coming close for Fulham not to get promoted here would take a, a, a failure of catastrophic proportions, like a something that is genuinely unthought of in the world of football. That that's how close we are to to what this would be. So I think it's fair to you know even if that were to happen, I don't think it's a it's something you can plan for or or suggest that might happen. You have to kind of look at what's around you and what you're looking at. And what we're looking at here is an incredibly impressive Fulham team who have known how to get results in in grind out ways, who have got results in in ways that, you know, are free flowing, who have managed to kind of dispatch almost everybody we've come across across the course of the season. So what you've got to look at now is how can how high can Fulham go? Because if you're going to consider the lows, you've got to consider the highs as well. And I think that if Fulham were to get 100 points and score 100 goals, they'd be the greatest team in championship history. No one's ever done that. No one's ever got 100 points and scored 100 goals. And that people will point to you and say, oh, the 106 points that Reading got is more impressive. I don't think so. Not the way and the manner of which this has been. If Fulham were to score 100 goals and pick up 100 points, 
I think there is a fair claim that that is the greatest championship squad in history. Um, and, and I think I'd be willing to argue that to pretty much anyone else. So, so that's, I think, where the high is, right? So what that is, is eight wins and 11 more goals. I, I, don't, think that's un- I don't think that's unfathomable at this point. I think it's difficult. There's only 11 games left. Eight out of 11 is, is, is tricky any, in anyone's book. But I don't think it's impossible. And and I think that if we're if we're looking at what might you know if you're looking at oh god it would take something desperate it could take something incredible as well and I think we're closer to incredible than desperate at, at this point where we are right now. Yeah, exactly. And look, I, I did some research uh, on the train back, and I looked at a few other notable clubs that have won the championship or division one. So after 35 games, Wolves had 76 points, which is exactly what Fulham had last season. Norwich City had 76 points. Uh, and I looked back to John Tagana's Fulham, who had 79 points at this stage. So they were three points better off than we are now. They did get to uh, 101 points. They didn't quite score 100 goals. Um, I think they got 90 in the end, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Um, but yeah, I mean, Jack, we are just a lot on the comparisons of those great sides. I saw a thread on Twitter talking about the greatest championship sides. The mm. Reading one came up. Newcastle in 09-10 came up. I genuinely think Wolves were one of the best assembled sides in a much more difficult championship league. But yeah, I think Fulham now with a few more wins can start to be talked about in those kind of brackets. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, what I'm really excited about is that that 2000 and 2001 team got a bus parade when they won the title. Do you reckon we'll have a bus parade if we win the championship? Well, I don't see why not. But well, we, haven't won a, we haven't won a trophy for what, 20 odd years? When did we win the Interstate 2003? So, you know, and I don't think we had a bus parade for that because one, it happens at a really weird point of the season. Um, yeah. And two, it didn't feel, you know, that you know, much as we love the Intertoto at the time, I don't, everyone was like, we eat jokes. Um, and three teams win at the same time. So, you know, all the, all, all the above, but there was definitely a parade for the, the title winning. Now, maybe it's because Fulham had come from the bottom of the bottom at that point yeah. and then risen through the divisions. Um, but it would be fun to get the old bus out, wouldn't it? You are right in a way that the 001 team, you know, it was a long time since Fulham had been in the top flight hold on, and hold has on. come it, from the bottom. It's winning a title. Of course there should be a bus. Like you've won the ti- a league title. Like, you know, I know promotions happened a couple of times, but to win a league title... Like yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. I don't think it should be a, we've, we've, yeah, seventh oh, I'm not, I'm not a, like saying I don't want one. I'm just not 100 percent sure there will be. Throwing things around the room. Get a bus out. <laughs> like, <laughs> only if we win. Only if we win. If if we win. Well, we'll see what happens. Uh, Peter's article is on the Athletic, looking at which records Fulham could break this season. And you can sign up to the Athletic right now by going to theathletic.com forward slash Fulham Pod. Right, we'll take a break there, and afterwards we'll look ahead to Barnsley on Saturday. If you're like me, then you love watching your favorite shows and sports. Although you may not feel the same way about the price you pay for TV. Fortunately, our friends at Sling let you watch the TV you love for a price you'll love. Get your favorite live sports, news, and entertainment for guess what? $35 a month. Forget about endless contracts and high prices. Sling offers incredible value when it comes to finding your favorite channels and shows. They have the best live TV all in one place. Live sports, Sling as ESPN, TNT, and TBS, just to name a few. Reality shows, you can watch TLC, Bravo, MTV, and more. National news, house MSNBC, CNN, and Fox News Sound. Thousands of movies and shows on demand. You guessed it, Sling's got that too. It's easy to set up, easy to use. You can stream on any device and record up to 50 hours with included DVR space. Check out sling.com for special offers. Sling, the live TV you love for a price you love. Try us today. Welcome to part two of the Fulhamish podcast. Sammy James here. I'm joined by Jack Collins. Hello, listeners. And Peter Rutzler. Hello. Right, um, Peter, just before we do a Barnsley preview, just wanted to get your thoughts on Nico Williams. Uh, he got two goals mm. last night. That fifth goal, uh, an absolute peach as well. Beautiful view of it uh, where we were behind the goal at the uh, Swansea.com stadium. It rolls off the tongue. Um, but yeah, really nice to see Nico get a couple of goals. The 15th different Fulham player to score a goal this season. Um, the fourth goal was well taken as well, came back to him and he, and he and he struck it well. He settled in so well to this team. And obviously on Saturday, 
it was just such a shame that that uh, shot from the halfway line didn't didn't quite make it. But yeah, he's really settled into this team. And, and a lot of people will be asking the question or demanding that we try and sign him in the summer. Um, we've spoken about it before being a realistic possibility. Um, but yeah, I guess we just have to wait and see as, as to how much Liverpool stick on him as an asking price. Yeah. Um, you know, he signed a, a long-term contract in 2020, didn't he? And I think as we've seen from this low move, it's, it, this, this low move has been about game time for him. Um, he said that after the game last night as well, that, you know, it's about getting those games in, particularly with the World Cup qualifiers, playoffs, sorry, coming up, some really important games for Wales and he wanted to be playing and, and he's doing that. It's still quite soon um, to know whether there could be something beyond that. <laughs> I think the more goals he scores and the better he performs, the, the more expensive he becomes. Um, but, you know, it's if he feels comfortable, which he seems to be in a good group, obviously seems to be combining superbly with, with Harry Wilson on that right-hand side. It's a good place to be. And if, if he wants regular Premier League games next season, providing we don't have that catastrophe that we outlined earlier, um, you know, then Fulham's a good good place for him. Um, but, you know, it's we'll have to see. I know there's been a lot of talk about is it linked to Fabio Carvalho. And at the time in the summer, I was always... It was always told to me that it was they were separate things, um, and the way that they're linked is the relations between the club and the relations between the two clubs seem to be quite positive um, at the moment. Obviously, the Harry Wilson move reflects that too. So you know, let's see. Um, I don't know if that will be a priority position. I think there will be a need for someone to support Kenny Tete because we've seen with 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 his injuries and, and whatever that that Fulham do need um, some support there, but. You know, we'll have to we'll have to see really, but yeah, as you said, I mean, the way, the way he settled in has been very very impressive. Um, it's quite staggering, really, that that last night was his first. Well, he scored two, didn't he? But his first senior club goals, yeah, um, of his career. Um, obviously, he scored for Wales, but um, even so, that is uh, it's remarkable because he he's clearly got fantastic technique, and, and we saw that. Uh, on Saturday in Saturday's game and I think my piece afterwards of looking at breaking it down and sort of how he took the shot and whatever but to do it again uh, a couple of few days later with a with a, a long range strike that just dips into the top corner the way it did chest and volley it was um, it's clearly a fantastic and talented player um, you know I think we haven't really he hasn't really been tested defensively like mm. uh, I mean obviously his debut is Man City so Okay, yeah. Um, he, did, he did all right that day, didn't he? Um, but, I mean, in terms of the basic, basics for it to be a, an outstanding right back, he's got that. And, um, yeah, I'm sure if he maintains the current performance levels, the, the clamours to keep him will, will, only, uh, will, only, will only grow. I'm trying to tell myself not to fall in love with another lone player. I can't, I can't go through it again. <laughs> Joachim Anderson, Ariola, Matt Target. Just don't do it to yourself, Sammy. It only ends in heartbreak. Um, Peter, Barnsley away on Saturday at a 12.30 kickoff. Not a particularly easy one uh, for the Fulham fans who will be heading up to Yorkshire for that. Um, they have been improved lately, uh, particularly at home. Um, they've, they've picked up some positive results. A uh, one-all draw uh, against Stoke last night and they had their hearts broken in the 95th minute when Lewis Baker got that equaliser for Stoke. Beat Middlesbrough a couple of weeks ago. Uh, they obviously beat QPR uh, at the beginning of, of February. And, and, and a player that's probably not been completely central to their rise, but he's certainly been a, a key asset uh, in what they've been doing lately is Domingos Kina. Uh, who's on loan from Watford. Obviously he was on loan at Fulham uh, earlier in the season and, and he's scoring some important goals. I would have thought maybe a month or two ago, this was an absolute shoehorn gimme. How many goals are Fulham going to score game? I still obviously think Fulham will and should win, but it's looking like a more difficult place to go at the moment. They've got something about them, Barnsley, particularly at Oakwell. Yeah, they're not out of the running at the bottom by any stretch of the imagination. I know for a long time, um, they were struggling to pick up a win at all. I think, I think after Poirier Asbagi's appointment, I think there's 11 games in the league without a win or yeah. something like that. And they've slowly begun to adapt to the way he wants the team to play. I think they're five points off safety. So, you know, it's, it's all to play for for them. And, and as you say, a key part of their recent upturn in form, which has seen wins over 
QPR, um, Hull, Middlesbrough, point at Stoke last night, um, is Dominguez Keener, as you say. And clearly it was, it was a move that didn't work at Fulham, it just didn't seem to fit, didn't get much of an opportunity. But at Barnsley, he's become quite a central figure in, in their sort of 4 3 free kind of system um, where he's playing from the left. And I think, I think in the, on the rare occasions that we did see Keener, um, I think in the FA Cup when he played against Bristol City in January, you know, that was a game where he played on that left-hand side and he did seem to suit it better. He just had a little bit more space, a little bit more time. Um, and, and, you know, he's, he's found a place where it's, it's working for him and he needed it, I think, in his career. And at this point, you know, you've got to be getting regular game time and he wasn't getting it at Fulham and, and he's, he's helped give them a chance. So, you know, what's to say that he doesn't come back to, to haunt Fulham on, on Saturday? It's the kind of thing that, it would happen when we'd have the uh, the narrative uh, the narrative spinning in, in all sorts of directions. But um, no, it won't be a straightforward game. As we've talked about, you know, it's three away games in seven days for Fulham at the moment. It's it's tricky on recovery. There's limited training that they can do. Um, not short distances either. You know, they went back by coach last night. So all of that will, will start to come into play. And I think from a Fulham perspective, it's it's got to be about rotation really. And I know Silver says he doesn't do it for the sake of it, but I think fitness may, may play a part. Yeah, 100%. Um, a lot of away games coming up. It's the run of five in a row because we then got West Brom on Tuesday. Uh, the Forest game, uh, if you aren't aware, um, that was supposed to be on the 19th of March, uh, has been postponed uh, now. It's probably going to be on the 26th of April. If you look at the calendar, that seems like the most likely date. And then after the international break, Fulham have a break of two and a half weeks uh, to recover for, from all of these games, which I guess Marcus Silva can kind of look to a finish line uh, this time next next week i'm sure the players will go on little breaks and uh and enjoy their time off if they haven't been selected for internationals then it's qpr then it's middlesbrough before fulham are finally back at home on the 9th of april still a month until we are back at a game at craven cottage which is quite mad uh in the middle of the season but hey that's how the fixtures fall and i'm sure that uh, fulham have been pretty good on the road lately Maybe it's a perfect uh, timing for us. Certainly looks pretty good on the road last night. Right, so we're going to take another break there. Afterwards, we'll do a couple of emails and then this will catch on. Part three of the Fulhamish podcast. Sammy James here with Peter Rutzler and Jack Collins. Couple of emails before we get into this will catch on. Uh, and John Schaefer, going back to what we were talking about earlier about what points Fulham might require, uh, wrote this email. Uh, this was actually before the Swansea game, so it might be slightly out of date, but should still apply. He says, maybe this will be useful in a future podcast episode, but from 2000 to 2021, 117 clubs have scored 75 or more points. And of those 113 have made the playoffs so if Fulham gets 75 there is a 97% chance you make the playoffs if a club scores 76 plus the odds go up to 98% so I think we can be pretty certain that we're in the playoffs but he says of course we want automatic promotion he says that 90 points plus is 100% success rate of um, getting promoted 89 points is 31 out of 32 Brighton are the only team in 2016 to get 89 but finish third and then 88 points is a 94% chance of getting promotion. And Fulham is one of the teams that has got 88 points and not gone up in the 17-18 season. So we're four wins off, pretty much getting to 95% certainty of automatic promotion. Uh, if we're, if John's email is anything to go by. So definitely uh, the odds are looking good. Um, and also an interesting point here from Dale. He said, I was going through our remaining games to pick a few away days. He noticed that uh, all of our next six opponents were beaten by us earlier in the season. Whereas we are yet to beat any of our final seven opponents. Which is quite an interesting um, quirk of the fixture calendar. Get it done before then. Get it done. <laughs> <laughs> Panicking. <laughs> Panicking already. Out pretty soon. Final seven games and Fulham haven't won any of them. And I, I look back through it and I was like, surely that's wrong. But he's Bob on. Absolutely Bob on. Obviously, if Forrest then gets moved to that part of the season, which it looks like it will be, um, then that won't be quite as uh, beautifully illustrated as it was for Dale. But as of the time of recording, that game hasn't been moved yet. So uh, it is still relevant for now. Right. Let's get into this will catch on. And the first one is from Matthew Kalmanson. You might recognize the name because uh, his email says, hi, chaps. 
Thanks for the constructive feedback on my Chalaba song to Here's the Way to Amarillo. Oh no. Echoing the email of support that you read out last week, I do think, much like the subject matter of the song, the foundations are solid and it's case of minor refinements to turn it into a fan favourite are needed. I'm not sure what the rules are on song re-entries, but I've had a go at ironing out the issues and also added an extra verse, which I'm hoping gets past the syllable police. Thanks from Matt. I am actually the syllable police now i'd like to be i'd like to be known as that in future when we're discussing this part of the episode so matt has sent a re-entry in if he hasn't changed his middle line i'm gonna go mad i'm gonna go absolutely nuts matt honestly (laughs) here we go just beyond the halfway be chosen space again oh nice reference to another one there and he keeps on scoring through the wind and rain Is this the way to mark coach first team? I want to play in front of Tim Ream Dreaming dreams of championship glory Like Kev McDonald playing here before me <laughs> Chalaba la 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 Chalaba la 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 Chalaba la 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 Chalaba, la, 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 la. I, I don't know what to say. I, I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> He's done it again. <laughs> I, I, have, I have no words. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like some sort of like. He's done univer- this to wind you up. I know, I know. I feel like a university person who's sent back a PhD thesis has been like, all right, fine, but need some corrections. <laughs> They've sent me back the same thesis. <laughs> but I know, mate. <laughs> <laughs> the syllable police is obviously still going to be mad about this. <laughs> uh, I love I, it. It's so good. To be fair, unbelievable wind up. I, apl- <laughs> I applaud. I applaud your commitment to my vexation. That's what I applaud. Matt, the syllable police is still angry. That line I'm is still angry. Horrendous. I'm just, I'm not I'm mad. I'm absolutely fuming actually. I don't know. I can't lie. <laughs> I enjoy it, Matt. Well done. You fully wound up Jack Collins. So uh, mission accomplished. You're going to be in my nut for days. <laughs> the rest of it's still quite a good the song. The rest of it's you... excellent. <laughs> Did you not <laughs> change that line? Uh, right. This one is from Fulhamish's very own Drew Heatley. Um, this was sent into uh, our WhatsApp group on Friday. <laughs> well, the early uh, hours of Saturday morning, actually. Yeah. <laughs> And it is the song Finally by C.C. Peniston. Track, to be fair, track. It is a track. We all woke up to this in a WhatsApp group like, what on earth is this? Um, I can't tell if I love it or hate it. See what you think. Finally, it's Harrison Reed after Hammersmith and and we're just so excited. Finally, it's Harrison Reed at the Hammersmith end, and we're just so excited. <laughs> My favourite bit is that somehow, for someone who is very much from England, they just at the start of the Hammersmith end line, it goes really American. It's like, <laughs> and the Hammersmith end. And then, <laughs> it's very, very, very good, though. I like it a lot. It works, <laughs> Sil- you know, in, in a syllabic sense. It's perfect. <laughs> and that's all That's all I ask. I think it's a solid nine out of 10. Could see it catching on. It's not too difficult. It's a, ca- it's a catchy tune. Um, if he does actually finally score at the Hammersmith end, I think it might need to be played. Give it, send it to Ivan. That would be absolutely <laughs> wonderful. Thank you, Drew. And the final This Will Catch On today is from Ishan Mahabir. And he says, Hey, Fulhamish, big fan of the pod and was left in total hysterics after Metro in open space. Pure genius. Have we heard it in the Hammersmith end yet? No. Uh, I don't think we have, no. They've not, not also not played We Found Love on the uh, PA system as far as I know yet, which I'm, I'm still a little bit angry about anyway. Ishan says, I've recently been humming We Dream of Ream to the tune of I Dream a Dream from, from Les Mis. <laughs> So he thought he'd complete the chant. Thanks for the great Fulham content. And that's from Ishan. So Ishan's voice is very good in this. I was pleasantly surprised. It's quite long. So strap in. I you're listening to them first. 
I feel I feel betrayed. Oh, I have to listen to them first because then people send them in like the weirdest file formats you've ever done. It's like an, a dot SRTVC file that I've got to fix. Anyway, so that's why I have to listen to them. This is Ishan's version of I Dreamed a Dream. We dream of Reem, oh, what a guy. <laughs> He's gonna bring us all the glory. We dream of dream and it's alright. We kind of like you're from Missouri. <laughs> you're 34, still going strong. You are the pride of Fulham fandom. Really want to know what this is going to arrive with. We know Fulham's where you belong. So I guess we'll overlook the man bun. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I was really hoping for a chorus. That's it ends amazing. quite abruptly, doesn't it? I don't know if he's just maybe working on the second part. Yeah, oh, but I was expecting a key change. All of it. Oh, that's amazing. That is exceptional. Ishan, thank you very it's much. It's never catching on, but it's maybe the best ever. <laughs> that's incredible. That was a also, the actually. fact that the glory and Missouri rhyme and the fandom <laughs> and man bun rhymes are up there with the best we've ever had. That that is phenomenal. Well done. And a great voice. What a day. I thought you guys would enjoy that one. Amazing. That is all for this will catch on uh, this week. There'll be plenty more uh, in the international break. I'm sure there'll be time to squeeze in all the ones that are clogging up my inbox. Uh, so we will get a, a bumper load of, of, of TWCOs in uh, the next couple of weeks. Uh, and that is all for the podcast today. Jack Collins, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sammy. And thank you to Ishan. You've really made my, made my day. Love that. What would you like to name the pod? Oh, I think we have to go with Jack Kelly's Swan Our Way, aren't we? That's very good. Swan Our yeah. Way. It feels like it fits with the theme of today's pod as well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and Peter Rutzler, thank you. No, thank you, Sammy. We will be back on Sunday looking back at that Barnsley game at 12.30. Uh, Coops is going to be hosting the next couple of podcasts because I'm going on holiday. Uh, but uh, until then, have a great weekend. Come on, you whites. You whites.